Go to Luke chapter 13 if you have your Bibles with you. Luke chapter 13. All right. Remember, we left off. Jesus asked this question to those that were on looking, that were watching his, his ministry. He said, what is the kingdom of God like? What can I liken it to? And he gives a couple of illustrations of what it's like, what's going to happen in it. In the middle of um, chapter 13, and he talks about, and again he said, whereunto shall I liken, verse 20, the kingdom of God? It is like leaven which a woman took and hid three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. So, he asked these questions, what's, this, what's the kingdom of God like, and, and what can I liken it to? And remember, his audience was often, there was a multitude there that wanted to see miracles. And there were others there that really needed the miracles. And then there were others there that really wanted to learn, that were really seeking. And then he always had the religious leaders there w- with him watching to see if he was going to say something, then, to trip him up, to try to catch him on something that he was, could have been doing wrong according to their laws and their traditions. And he asked this question, and he asked it for a reason. He says, what can I liken the kingdom of God to? And and the illustrations he gives basically have to do with the kingdom of God, God's kingdom, God's people that's going to start, it's going to grow, but then it's going to become leavened. And then when it gets toward the end of it, even God's kingdom, God's people, you're not going to be able to differentiate, differentiate and discern who's really in the camp and who's not in the camp. And then then he gives these, and he starts to talk to them about, but when he comes... The second time, that's when all of those things will be sorted out. Who really belongs to God and who doesn't belong to God. And when he comes again, there's going to be judgment for those who do not belong to God. And there's going to be eternal blessing for those who do belong to God. And as he's going through this, remember, the scribes, the Pharisees, the onlookers, they're always there watching and listening and waiting to see if they can get him on something. Now remember, in the Jewish mindset of the day, you thought you were in the camp and in the kingdom just because why? Because you were Jew, nationally. They had thought they were God's people, they they were God's blessed, right? That they were the apple of God's eye. And just because they were of, from Abraham and the line of Abraham, they thought they, they were in and everybody else was just fodder for the fuel and fire of hell. That's what they thought. So when the scribes and the Pharisees would often hear his preaching and teaching, it came against their thought process. It came against their mindset. It came against their teachings. And they often got troubled by it. So what they would do on occasion, actually over and over again, was try to embarrass Jesus to try to trip him up, to try to stump him with these foolish questions. They would actually, in some cases, get so enraged and angered that they would try to kill Jesus, all right? And if you go back and if you look at the life of Jesus, right, how many times he, they tried to murder him? He's a little baby laying in a, 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 a horse trough, a manger, we sing, right? And this people there, Herod the Great, that hear about this Messiah, this Christ, Kill him, right? And God miraculously delivers him. Jesus grows up in this town of Nazareth. He finally starts his earthly ministry. Remember, he grew up kind of obscure, no one really understanding who he was or where he was from. But when he starts his earthly ministry, he's ready to get going for God the Father and do what he was called to do. He goes into the synagogue, preaches his first sermon, and what do they do? He picks up Isaiah, he starts to tell them, this day the scripture's fulfilled in your ears, and they want to... Push him off a cliff. They push him out of, the, out of the synagogue to the edge of a cliff. And it says his hour was not yet come. And he passed right through their midst. They wanted to kill him at that time. Through his earthly ministry, they picked up stones over and over again to stone and to kill him because they didn't like what he said. And now we get to another point where the onlookers there, they're hearing about the kingdom and the kingdom of God. And Jesus saying unto them, there, there are the last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. Basically saying to them, to them you guys might not be in, and by the way, there are those that are going to be there you think are going to be first, but they're going to be last. And they don't want to hear this. 
And they're dumbfounded by this teaching. Verse 31. And the same day after this teaching about what's going to happen when he comes back and who's going to be thrust out of the kingdom, remember, some Jews that thought they were in, he said, we're not in. Right? The same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get out and depart hence, for Herod will kill you. Someone else tries to kill him. So the Pharisees are coming to him. Now, we don't know if they're really in cahoots with Herod at this time. We don't know. You better go. Because this Herod's going to kill you. Okay? Now, this is Herod Antipas. By the way, Herod was a title of, of basically, of, of king. And we know Herod was just a pawn king, but Caesar was really the king over the area. And we know that all kings are just pawn kings because the only real king is Jesus Christ. We know that. The Bible says that no one is given power unless it's given to them from above. Okay? But this is Herod Antipas at the time. This is the Herod that had captured John the Baptist and really wanted to hear a little bit about what he was talking about, was convicted by what he was saying. But remember, Herod's wife and her daughter, right, seduced Herod, Salome, tricked him into making a pact and a covenant, saying, and, and Herod, gets, he's so drunken in a stupa, full of lust for this, this young girl, he says, I'll give you whatever you want up to half of my kingdom. And she goes, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. This is that Herod that had John the Baptist killed. All right? Now, Jesus' popularity has gone much farther than that now. All right? Herod... Freaked out. I, I already had a deal with John. I already had a deal with the uprising and the back, backlash of beheading John. I don't want to have to deal with this Jesus situation now. Politics. Pharisees, religious leaders coming against Christ. The political leaders coming against Christ. And listen, you'll notice, you'll find, when you really serve Jesus Christ, when you really live for Jesus Christ, you'll go against the religious customs of the day and you'll go against the politics of the day. It's just going to happen. Now, I'm not saying, listen, there's Christians, you know, people that go out there and they, they try to start a fight with the government. They try to start a fight with, you know, we need to reclaim America for Jesus Christ. So let's politic. Let's convert America, bring them back to Jesus Christ through magisterial reform. That's not how we do it. The way we win people to win the nation to Jesus Christ is to win people to Jesus Christ. That's how revival happens. God uses you and me to reach people, and in turn, that starts something, a revival, and you know what? Then the land changes, and things turn back to the way that it's supposed to be. Right? So the religious leaders of the day are against Christ. The political leaders of the day against, uh, are against Christ. And he says, Herod's coming to kill you. Watch out. Well, look what Jesus says. And he said unto them, Go you and tell that fox, it's feminine, that vixen, that sneak. Foxes were sly animals, okay? They were. They're quiet, they're, they're crafty, and they're killers, all right? And he says, Herod, that's what you are. And he basically tells them, go to Herod. Now, this is the only place in the four Gospels where Jesus talks about somebody basically derogatorily. He says he's a fox. He's a sneak. He's crafty. And he goes, go and tell him, Behold, I cast out devils. I do cures. Today and tomorrow, in the third day, I shall be perfected. He says basically, now this is a Hebrew idiom. All right? He's saying, I'm doing things that I'm supposed to do for God. Today and tomorrow, and I'm going to continue to do that. And there's nothing you can do, Herod, that's going to really stop me from doing that. And the third day, I'll be perfect, perfected. What he's saying is, the third day, he goes, I'm going to be perfected. I'm going to the cross. That's God's ultimate plan for me, is to go to a cross. Now listen. He says, I'll be perfected. That's my goal. That's what I've come to do. Is there any other way out? No, he had to go to a cross. That was his goal. That's what he came to do. Shall I pray, Father, deliver me from this? No, this is why I came into the world, right? 
Now listen, he knew that God had a divine plan for him. Now listen, who killed Jesus? Was it Herod? Was it the Jews? Was it the Romans? Who was it? We know the scriptures teach us that God had a divine plan for the death of Jesus Christ. We know that the Jews were the, the antagonists, the Jewish leaders. We know that the Romans were the executors, but we know that God behind all, that was the master planner of it all, right? That it pleased the Father to bruise him, okay? God had a divine plan for him. Jesus knew that. It says, Lo, it is written of me in the volume of thy book, O God, I delight to do thy will. Now listen, he knew that God had a divine plan. God the Father had a perfect divine plan for him. And that plan was fulfilled and perfected, like he says, his main goal was to go to a cross. Now listen, might I say this for you and for me? You know God's perfect plan for you is for you to be crucified? He said, what are you talking about? Jesus was crucified for me. He paid for me. Yes, that's true. He did. But you know there's no glory in your life there's no glory to God in your life until you've learned to crucify your flesh. Until you've learned and I've learned daily. Paul said, I die daily. Daily I take up my cross and follow after him. Daily I have to tell myself, you have to tell yourself that it's not about me. It's not about my plans, my goals, my ambitions, what I want out of life, but what he wants for his glory. And that takes some dying. That takes you and me having to take our crosses and pick up our crosses and follow after him. And you know, and you know what? The cross is painful. Amen. Spiritually speaking, the cross is painful. To come to the point in our lives that day after day, week after week, year after year, we continually say, you know what? It's not about me. I'm taking up the cross with Jesus Christ. He died for me. It's the least I can do is lay down my life daily for him. That's God's divine plan for you and for me. And it's hard sometimes. And it's painful. Just when you think you get to a certain place in your life where you're, it's going to be easy straight for a little while, you know God the Holy Spirit speaking to you and he's saying, let it go, leave it behind, crucify yourself, let it go, die to that and live to me. See, that's when God can really work. That's when God starts to really work. I have to come to the place over and over again in my life where I say to God, God, you know what? I'm living a little bit too much here. I need to die so Jesus can live, so the light of Jesus Christ can be seen in my life. See, that's God's divine plan for every single one of us. And there's no glory without the suffering. God has a divine plan for every one of us. Listen, remember Paul gets to the end of his life and he basically says God had a divine plan for him, a divine route that he was to take. And he goes, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. And if you look at the story of Paul's life, man, it was crucifying. It was painful. He founded churches. He started churches. And some of the churches that he founded and he started, he was rejected by them. Right? And then he wanted to go to... <laughs> To the Jews, being a Pharisee of the Pharisees, knowing the Old Testament law in and out, having the whole Old Testament memorized, he thought for sure that God was going to use him to go and save all the Jewish people. Nope. God said, no, 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 you're the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter, the buffoon, is going to be the apostle to the Jews. Because they looked at Peter as like, this guy's a clown fisherman. We, we, we're not going to listen to him, the religious leaders. It's the, the opposite. That's how God always does it. He flips it upside down. I sound like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still in Revere. I'm from Revere, and I'm a Reverian. But God says, no, you go over there. Maybe people from Revere will drive up there. Whatever. <laughs> it's just how God does things sometimes. So he gets the glory. We don't get the glory. But God has a divine plan for each and every one of us. The Apostle Paul would say it like this. He has a measuring rod or a measuring line meted out, measured for every one of us to walk in and to do. Your measuring line is not mine and mine is not yours. 
But he has a divine plan. If you read Psalm 139, the Bible talks about how God goes before us. He goes behind us. That we can't get out of his will. Even if you try to run from him, David said in Psalm 139, he goes before you even there. God has a plan for every single one of our lives. And you're at peace the most in your life when you know that you've crucified your flesh, that you believe in Jesus Christ, that you die daily, you deny yourself, and you're walking in that plan. That's where there's peace. Now, there might not be peace in everything else. It might not look peaceful. It might not feel feel peaceful. But you know there's peace and there's joy when you're living for God and doing things God's way. Right? Just like Jesus says, it's God's will that... I do cures today and tomorrow. And the third day, I'll be perfected. It's my goal to go to the cross. Verse 33. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kills the prophets. Now, you see the heart of God here. Because Jesus knows what's going to happen. When he started this discourse a few chapters before, he said, I'm going to Jerusalem. This is what I've come to do. And he knows he's going to get to Jerusalem. He knows what's going to happen. He knows he's going to be rejected. And his heart here is it's not in anger toward Jerusalem. It's in pain over what's going to happen to Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Kind of like, oh, Simon, Simon. Satan hath desired that he might sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. Oh, Martha, Martha. You're coming about many things, Martha, right? And I would see that Jesus says this to us. When we're running around crazy, we don't want to walk in his will. We don't want to do things his way. He'll say, oh, Matthew, Matthew. Or this church, church. As in Revelation, he addresses the churches. And he'll speak to us like that with that kind of pain in his heart and in his voice. And that's what he says, and that's how he feels for Jerusalem right now. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And now listen, towns and cities are known for certain things. Right? Boston, maybe the Boston Tea Party, Boston Massacre. Dallas, assassination of JFK. Philadelphia, Liberty Bell. I don't know, you know some more. Jerusalem. Jesus said you're known for killing the prophets. That was the one place God set his heart, right? That God set his heart, the apple of his eye, the Jews, the Jewish people in Jerusalem, the city of the great king. But what were they known for? They were known for killing the prophets. And Jesus no different. Remember, Jesus, on one occasion, he tells a parable about a landowner, who, a landowner who lets out his vineyard, right? And he lets out his vineyard to, to a bunch of um, hired help. And he lets it out to them. And, and, and then he sends back some of his servants to go to the vineyard to reap some of the fruit. And so, as some of the servants come from the landowner, they go to this hired help and they say, hey, where's the fruit from the vineyard? And they say, you ain't getting any fruit. And they kill the servants, one after the other. And he said, well, the landowner says, okay, I'll, I'll let that go. I'll leave it alone, even though this is my vineyard. And I got some hired hands that are supposed to be taken care of, and I, and I just want the fruit of it, right? And then what does he say? He goes, okay, what I'll do next is this. I'll send my son. Surely they'll reverence my son. Surely they'll give him the fruit that's supposed to come from it. And he sends his son, this landowner, and what do they do? The hired help, they say, it's the son, it's the heir. Let's kill him. And then we can seize on the inheritance. We can take the vineyard to to, to ourselves. And the Pharisees knew that Jesus was talking about them. Because the Jewish people in Jerusalem were God's inheritance. Were God's people. And Jesus wanted to gather them. He wanted to take them in. He wanted to be their Messiah. Listen, remember he would go and do miracles. Remember the time he feeds the 5,000? He feeds the 5,000 and they say, hey, let's make him king. Because he can feed us. Wow. 
He can do these miracles, and when we're hungry, he can feed us. He's like a magician. Remember what he said? Unless you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you have no part of me. Right? And the Bible says the words that he spake unto them were spirit and life. And basically what he was tell- telling them, unless you want me and my sacrifice for you, then you have no part of me. You don't really want me, he said to them. You want the miracles. You want the loaves. You want the fish. You don't want me. He wanted to be their God. He wanted to be their Savior, their Messiah. He wanted to have a relationship with them. And all they wanted was bread. All they wanted was more miracles. And sometimes we're like that, aren't we? Lord, what else can you do for me? What else can you give me? Because I don't have enough, Lord. Give me a little bit more. Give me some more bread, some more fish, some more things. Then I'll be fulfilled. And Jesus just wants you. And you should just want him. But we get like that. We're the same way sometimes. And and, and this is what he's talking about here. He goes, I'm going to a cross. I'm going to be perfected. And he knows what's going to happen to Jerusalem as a whole. And he's brokenhearted over them, right? Right? They wanted to make him king on occasion because of what he can do in, in, you know, in miracles and in signs and wonders and all of that. He wanted to be the God of their heart. And he says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kills the prophets and stones them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen does gather her brood under her wings. Now listen. You see the heart of God in this statement. God's heart is always to gather. God's heart is always to bring in, to bring close. That's why, what does God do when God saves us? When God saves us, you, you, know, you might have got saved out there, you might have read a gospel track, you might have got saved you know, hearing a message in church, wherever it was, but what is God's heart? God's heart is always to take you from isolation and bring you in with his people, to gather you together right? That's the heart of God. It's always to gather. It's always to bring close. Adam sins in the garden. You know, it's not God that ran away. It's Adam that ran away. It's God that called them back. It's God that called them close. When Israel would sin over and over again, it wasn't Israel that's saying, oh God, we're sorry. We repent. We want to stay close to your side. No, they ran farther away. It was God that called them back. It was God that sent the prophets. It was God that came after them. Just like you and just like me, when you sin and when you go away from Jesus Christ, it's not you that comes crying back to him. It's because Because God gathered you back to him. If you haven't realized that, you need to know that. It's God that brings you back. It's God that gathers you. It's God that seeks your soul. It's God that wants to be close with you. And we push him away. And we push him away. And then you see the human side of it. But you would not. You would not. You have God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. God gathers, man resists. You can work that one out with John Calvin, I don't know. But all I know is that's what it says. God wants to bring close. Man wants to push away. And sometimes, you know what, I know in my own life, when God's working in my life and God wants to bring me closer and God wants to bring me closer and God wants to do more of me, he wants to show me more in me that I need to turn away from so he can fill more of me. You know what I do? I want to push him away. I will not. I won't go that far, God, no way. You know what I say? Sometimes I talk to my wife and it's usually after a big screw up with her or with something that I did. And and I'll talk to her and I'll say, listen, I just can't handle the love of God. I can't handle it. I can't take it in. I'm afraid of it. It scares me. That he would still love me and want to have a relationship with me when he knows all my thoughts, all my past, all my evil intents, even after I'm saved and in the ministry and everything else. I can't handle this love and I want to push it away. And that's what Jesus is saying here. 
How I love you, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I want to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks. And you know the story of the mother hen. When the hawk's flying around, she clucks. The, hen, the, the little chicks come running. She protects them, covers them. You've heard the illustration, the story before. I don't know if it's a true story. I heard that it is, that there was a fire in the field one time, and, you know, the farmer went out, and he kicked over this mother hen, and underneath the, the mother hen's burned wings were live chicks that she was protecting during the fire. That's exactly what Jesus does for you and for me all the time. He took the fire of the judgment of God, right, so we can be protected. And it says in Psalm 91, right, about being covered under the shadow of God's wings, that he'll protect us. That's what God does for us. That's what God wanted to do for Jerusalem, but it says they would not. They didn't want it. They said no. And look what he says to them. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Your house At the beginning, when he started his earthly ministry, he cleansed the temple. He said, this is my father's house. He goes, it's a house of prayer. He made it a den of thieves. Then he cleanses the temple again at the end of his ministry. He goes, it's my father's house. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. And now he says, your house. Your house. It's left unto you desolate. Surely Jesus seeing the future, knowing the future, what was going to happen to Jerusalem. Remember Titus Vespasian surrounds the city, starves starves the people out. 1.1 million Jews die in the siege. Titus Vespasian only wanted them to surrender. He wanted to salvage life. The the story goes, Josephus tells us that Titus Vespasian goes out and actually says this this, this prayer to God. He goes, God, please don't hold me accountable for what's going on in this city. He's not even a believer. He goes, please don't hold me accountable because he just wanted them to surrender because he wanted to stop the carnage and the bloodshed. 1.1 1.1 million Jews died. Josephus tells us that the blood ran so high that it ran up into the doors, over the threshold in people's houses and put out their fires. That's how horrible. People turned to cannibalism and everything else. Destruction of the temple. Jesus said not one stone was left upon another, and it wasn't. Because the story goes like this. Titus Vespasian said, don't touch the temple. Leave it alone. Well, a couple of Roman soldiers, they got a little drunk and they shot an arrow into the temple and what happened was some of the, the articles got on fire and it was like a wood-burning stove in there with all the gold and everything else. And it got so hot in there with, with the fire that started in the temple that the gold started to melt and as the gold started to melt, the other Roman soldiers saw it. They said the place is destroyed already. They started to what? They started to pry one stone off another to carve out the rest of the gold as the spoils of war. Just like Jesus said, not one stone left upon another. Jesus was broken hearted over this. He was broken hearted. The heart of God was to gather them to keep them, to bring them close, to forgive their sin, to be their Messiah. But they would not. See, that's what I think happens when people stand before the judgment one day. I don't think God's sitting up in heaven saying, oh, I can't wait for this one to die and that one to die so I can burn them in hell, so I can have them pay for their sin forever. I can't wait to do that. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That doesn't make me happy. That doesn't make me happy. I have no pleasure in that, right? But it's sad. Because what people are doing is they resist, they resist, they resist, they resist all the way into eternity. And God says, you would not. It's not that he would not, it's that we would not. It's that they would not. They resist. The love and the grace of God. Now again, I don't know how that works in every person's life. 
I don't know how it works with your neighbors next door, with the people over there in Africa and everyone around the world who never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. But all I know is that God is righteous and God is just and God is holy and God made provision for their sins on a cross. That's all I know. And I know that the Holy Spirit goes out every single day. It convicts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. That's everybody. And all I know is people resist that. Because God's trying to gather them. But people resist it. Now in the context, it's to Israel. And he says, And verily or truthfully I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come when you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now listen. It's interesting. Because if you go to Zechariah, you could turn there, chapter 12, if you want. Verse 9. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. By the way, I think we live in that day and age. Jerusalem is a nation again, and everybody wants to destroy them. Okay? But God says, And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. What God's describing here is in that day, they're going to say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord that the remnant that's back in Jerusalem on that day, in Israel, in that day, in the future, God is going to pour out upon them the spirit of repentance and supplication and sorrow that as a nation, they're all going to turn back to God. Just like Paul prophesies in, in Romans 11. As it is written, he says, all of Israel as a nation will be saved. So in that day, in the future, right before Jesus comes again during the, in the second coming, all of Israel is going to say, you know what? Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Our forefathers crucified him, handed him over to the Romans. And they're going to say, they're going to actually cry out for him to come back. And as they cry out for him to come back, you know what? He comes back. He saves them from Antichrist and they mourn for him and they say, we did this, our fathers did this, we crucified him, we pierced him. And they look upon him whom they have pierced and they cry out for him and he comes back but God pours out upon them the spirit of supplication and repentance. And they ask him, where did you get the wounds in your hands? He says, these I received in the house of my friends. Right? Right? And all of Israel repents. Jesus saves them from the horror of Antichrist. Believe me, I don't think we're that far away from this. From the slaughter of Antichrist. Saves them, gives the kingdom back to Israel. And then all nations come in the millennial kingdom to Zion to be taught of God. That's what's coming next. Prophetically, that's what we're waiting for. Now listen, say, why doesn't all this happen now? What is God waiting for? You know what he's waiting for? He wants people to come to him. Because in that day, when he comes again, that's it, the door's shut. There's no more chance for salvation. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So we need to be out there inviting people, tell them about Jesus Christ. If you don't want to tell them, bring them here and I'll tell them for you. It's easy for me to tell them. It's easy for me to tell them from here. It is because they expect someone to tell them about something spiritual. I know it's harder one-on-one when you're out there sometimes. But God wants people to be saved. God wants to gather people. And Jesus, remember his life, again, who killed him? They wanted to kill him from when he was a baby, from when he was a kid, when he started his earthly ministry, all through his earthly ministry, and eventually he's handed over, and he is killed, and he is crucified. But God the Father is behind it all. God had a plan. Go to Acts chapter 2, and we'll close with this. Remember Peter preaching... At Pentecost, 
And many of the religious leaders were there who actually yelled for Jesus to be crucified. Look in verse 17. It says, It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Acts chapter 2, I'm sorry, verse 17. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men and your, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and, vi- blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Now there's a 2,000 year or more span right in those verses that he's saying. He already poured out his spirit upon all of us, upon all flesh. We know in the last days it gets poured out on Jerusalem, Judah, Israel in particular. Then he starts to describe what's going to happen right before the last days. And it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know. Him being delivered by the, the, the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. See what he's saying here? He says it was God's perfect plan, his determinate counsel and foreknowledge. You ever ask yourself the questions? Because I do. God, if you knew Adam was going to do this, why did you even let this happen and create anything? If you knew Lucifer was going to rebel, if you knew if this and if that and why this and why that, if you knew all of these things, then why? Because God had a perfect plan. God the Father said, you know what? It's by my determinate counsel, my foreknowledge. You know what? I'm going to send my son into that vineyard. Right? Right? And the vineyard is the vineyard of souls, fruit, worshipers that the Father seeks to worship him, John chapter 4. And God, you know, and God says, I'm going to send my son into that vineyard. And the, you know what? They're going to turn him over. They're going to kill him. They're going to crucify him. But God says, you know what? That's okay because I'll forgive those who handed him over and I'll forgive everybody if they just believe in my son, Jesus Christ. That's my plan. See, this book, when you pray, don't you want to know that you're praying to a God that's alive? When you sing, don't you want to know you're praising the living God? Don't you want to know that? Because I want to know that I'm not just singing to the ear. I want to know that this book's the word of God. I want to know that when I tell something about Jesus and, and, and you know, I'm telling them until they're blue in the face and they're not listening, I want to know that I'm doing what God wants me to do because God is alive and he's well and he's powerful and, and he's given me a book to live by. I want to know that he's alive. I want to know that. Don't you want to know that? See, that's one of the ways you know, because only God could come up with this stuff. Really. Only God could come up with salvation's plan. Read Romans chapter 5. Only God could, really. That's why Paul breaks off in in his letters and his epistles into doxology about the wisdom of God. And he starts to praise God because he knows only God can come up with this stuff. No other holy book has any of what the Bible has. They all pale in comparison to this book. None of them have predictive prophecy. None of them. The Quran has one prophecy that was self-fulfilled by Muhammad. You know what self-prophecy is? Self-fulfilled prophecy? Well, I'm prophesying today that after church I'm going to go home and watch the Patriots game. So I'm prophesying that to you. All right? And for me to fulfill that, I'm just going to go and do it. All right? That's pretty easy. But not the, the Bible doesn't have that. I believe, what is it? Over 300 prophecies about Christ and his first coming were fulfilled in the life of Christ up to the cross of Christ. To the T. Someone did a study of just to fulfill eight of those prophecies that were fulfilled on the cross. The probability of that is like this. If you filled up all the known Milky Way galaxy with copper pennies, okay, and you painted one red, 
Okay, so picture the whole Milky Way galaxy is filled up with copper pennies, and you painted one of those pennies, pennies red, and you flew through it on a spacecraft, and just at the right amount of time, you reached out, and you happened to grab that one red penny. That would be, that would be the chances that only eight of those prophecies would come to pass on the cross when Jesus fulfilled them. See, we serve the living and the true God. The holy God that died for us, that loves us, right? That's whom we serve. Let's live for him. Let's do all we can to glorify him because you know what? What we do now counts forever.